Our first question tonight is from Caroline Room, please. Caroline Room. Uh, does Britain's failure to continue working in some moderately bad weather make us an international laughing stock? Are we an international laughing stock for what's gone on in the last few days? Nigel Farage. Well, I think what's happened here is the government, uh, the Mayor of London, uh, and local authorities, in fact, the entire political class, they all so firmly believe in the theories about global warming that they never thought it was going to snow ever again in this country. <laughs> I, I have to say there's another very positive side to what happened this week. I'm sure everybody in this room remembers when they were kids the excitement of waking up to thick snow. And I must admit the look on my eight-year-old daughter's face on Monday morning when she saw the snow and then realised that her school, like thousands of others in the country, was closed was a joy to behold. But what was interesting is on the blogs today one or two people have been saying that 18 years ago, the last time southern England had a very heavy snowfall, that in those days the councils had in place a system whereby in the autumn they would speak to local farmers, they would speak to local builders merchants and people who own JCBs, and they would put in place a network where as soon as there was heavy snow, these people would go out and would grip roads and clear drifts and all the rest of it. And that now, 18 years on, 18 more years of centralised government where government wants to control everything from the centre, both at national and at local council level, that network no longer exists. So I think we were, given that the Met Office got it right, and that makes a nice change, doesn't it? But given the Met Office got it right, I thought, frankly, the way most of Britain didn't go to work on Monday and Tuesday was really pretty shambolic. I would like to point out, actually, back to Nigel, that um, global warming will probably result in more snow for Britain. Um, so we probably should get used to this kind of weather, and perhaps the government needs to start preparing for that. Okay. And I'll take a couple more points. The, the man with spectacles in the second row there, you said. You can't guarantee row. that um, it's going to be another 18 years before we get a downfall of snow, and it's a question of priority. Um, I wouldn't mind some more gritting lorries and sand uh, if it saves people's lives um, I'd save the money by not paying into councillors pensions okay and the, and the woman at the very back there on the right yeah is it fair to demand British jobs for British workers in a global economy is it fair to demand British jobs for British workers in a global economy referring of course to the wildcat strikes that uh, were solved were just solved this week but is it fair to demand it so you you don't want the rules on employment change whereas Labour, or at least part of Labour, appears to want it changed. Well, the, you, you're, not, you're not in agreement the, with that. The, the government appears to be again in two minds about this. But you're Alan only Johnson, in one mind. Alan Johnson, yes, one mind which I've just given you, David. Right. But Alan Johnson is saying one thing about the rules, and Peter Mandelson is, Mandelson is saying something completely different. Okay, so well, the government can't even decide what its position on this issue is. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll come to that in just a moment. Nigel Farage. Now, the question was British jobs for British workers in a global economy. And you're quite right, it is a global economy. In response to that, all Theresa could talk about was the European Union. I think what happened with the Lindsay oil refinery dispute was that the penny dropped for millions of people in Britain as to what had been done to them by successive Conservative and Labour governments, namely signing us up to a political union whereby no British government can guarantee British jobs for British workers. And I will predict that they may have done a deal and gone back to work, but this is going to get a lot worse. We're just about to embark upon massive government spending projects like the Olympics, like power stations that are being built, like the Council House programme that Gordon Brown unveiled last week, and the dawning realisation that British taxpayers, in the depths of a recession, will be funding possibly tens of thousands of workers that are coming into this country from Eastern Europe is something that I think is going to make British workers and British taxpayers very, very angry indeed. Okay, I am okay. not against well foreign workers. I'm all for people coming to work in this country and for us to go and work there. But it should be done on a proper work permit system and we as a country should decide who lives and works in Britain, not the institutions in Brussels. It's as simple as that. Okay. 
despite the economic downturn, there are still something like half a million vacancies in our economy. There are large numbers of people, sadly, without work. What kind and of jobs reason... are these half million vacancies that your well, government there's... goes on about all the time but nobody seems to want to take? Well, they're skilled jobs and that's the problem. They're skilled jobs? They are skilled jobs. Half a million skilled jobs? They are half a million jobs that require some degree of qualification. Well, that's and slightly I'm... different from a skilled yeah. job. No, well, it, it, these days it's necessary to have now, a qualification. Now, what do you seriously mean when you say half, well, if you say half a million skilled jobs and there are people being thrown out of work, there should be no problem with people being thrown well, out of work, but, but if, that's, if, if your valuation is correct. That's exactly the problem the economy has faced for a number of years. What's the government been doing for 12 years if these people don't have these skills? Well, What's it, the government been well, trying let, to do uh, for 12 Theresa, years? Theresa, in 12 years we have created 3 million jobs in this country. And as it happens, Jeff, 80% of those jobs have actually gone to foreign workers. Precisely. Well, I checked those they've statistics and thought you'd workers. say that. That is not true. And they've gone to that is not true. Jeff, in, 2004, clear. in 2004, right, one at a time, in 2004, one at a time. you Just opened the door in 2004 and you said to millions of people from poor countries in Eastern Europe, as many of you as want to come and live and work in this country can. Well, and, and frankly, that was an irresponsible thing well, to do, and it has directly added... Let's be clear, right, let's, let's, be clear, let's clear, clarify the You point. and your no. party want this country out of the European Union. Absolutely. And as a result, half of our trade will disappear. Why? Half of our trade oh, is inside the oh, European Union. Oh, no. Millions of jobs we can do better than that, surely. No, we can do much you, better than well, that. Wait a moment, wait a moment, wait a moment. Try and stick to one argument at a time, and you may, <laughs> may get somewhere. Theresa May said 80% of the new jobs created yeah, went to foreigners. You said, I can refute that. Farage says, no, it's true. But you, you, you refute it. After the 3 million extra jobs, about 1.5 million are to British citizens. The way this calculation is made, it depends on counting people born abroad, but who are British citizens. Okay. And that's the explanation. 1.5 million people are British citizens who have right. those jobs. Just one... Mr. Brown hasn't got a, a, any option whatsoever because we are run by Europe. Okay, we have no, we have no right. say whatsoever. Quite right. There's nothing they can do about it, and that's the problem. Yes. That's why they're at sixes and sevens arguing with each other. They can talk but what, all they like, but, what's, but, but, but in what, reality... Right, well, you two agree yeah, with each other. Well, we do. <laughs> sir. Yeah. Man, man in the front I'll see you there. afterwards, please. Um, why is a word that was accepted 30 years ago no longer accepted in the current times. Yeah, look, I mean, we've all seen lots of Carol Thatcher in the jungle and everything else. I don't believe there's an ounce of malice in her. And the difference between public and private is that in private, after a programme, in the green room, we read over several glasses of wine, things get said that wouldn't necessarily get said in public, in, 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 in public, and sometimes they're done in a jokey way and they can be taken out of context. I don't believe she would have said that maliciously. Now, I, I accept that I could be wrong, but I don't believe she did it maliciously. I think the problem here, with the BBC taking the action that it's taken, is it appears to have a very odd double standard. You know, the chap here, the chap here, who mentioned Jonathan Ross, I mean, Jonathan Ross publicly, publicly, was offensive to millions of people. He's kicked into touch for a few weeks. He comes back and within ten minutes... Four months. ...on his Radio 2 show, but within ten minutes of being back on the show, he was once again offending millions of people. And it's not just him, it's Chris Moyles and many other people. So it seems that you can be vulgar, you can be gross, you can offend millions of people, and the BBC find that OK. But if you make a comment, which I suspect was made more in jest than maliciously in private, you lose your job. It's double standards, it doesn't make sense, and under any, any sense of equity, she should be given a second chance. Okay. Is Britain being held to ransom by America over the alleged torture of Binyam Ma Mohammed? Nigel Farage, what do you make of it? Well, we share intelligence with America, and over the last decade, we've been America's most important military ally. For that reason, I simply don't believe that the government did not know that the Americans have now for some years been using torture on a very widespread basis. And I think the fact that successive administrations have turned a blind eye to the use of torture on this scale is really something that is very, very shameful upon the British government indeed. I really do. I, I think this, this question of whether we're being held hostage gets to the heart of the special relationship. We have a special relationship with America, but we should be critical friends of America. There should be times when we say no to America. You're not doing the right thing. I agree with Theresa, we have a new administration. There is a fresh opportunity. Perhaps what we need from the British government is that Hugh Grant moment in the film Love Actually, 
where a British Prime Minister actually stands up to an American President and says we can only be good friends if we do this on the right terms. We've been too craven to America for too, too long. N Nigel, Nigel, Nigel Farage, um, <laughs> Jeff Hume began by saying that all the documents had been provided to Binyam Muhammad's lawyers for the case that he yeah. was fighting. What is it you want to discover from these documents if, as he says, what I want the, to know, the legal position uh, for Binyan has been, he's been protected by being shown, given all the documents What I want requested. to know is did the British government know that torture was being used upon this individual and upon hundreds of other individuals? And if it did know that, why didn't it stand up to America and say, look, we know you've been through a psychological trauma after those towers crashed on 9-11, but what you are doing is wrong. Right. That's what I want to know. To find out more about who we are and what we stand for, go to the UK Independence Party website at www.ukip.org.